I am welcome to Original and Necessary, Australia's premier podcast series on everything that ever wanted to know about the National Disability Insurance Scheme. Brought to you by the Summer Foundation. I am your host, Dr. George Talaporis, and on today's episode, we've got Kate Fernley, who was recently appointed to chair the National Disability Insurance Agencies. We'll talk to him about why he took on the role and what he hopes to achieve for people with disabilities. And much more. Check it out. Hi, Kate. Welcome to the show. G'day, Dr. George. Thanks for having me. Oh, mate, you are. You have the most important role on the most important film that is the NDIS, man. Woo! How's it feel? <laughs> um, I'm going to sound like a politician straight away and just say that every role within the NDIA is the most important role within the NDIA. Uh, we need to make sure that wherever you are within the organisation, the understanding that what what work you do is just pivotally important in the way somebody lives their life. And, and whether you are the chair of the board, on the board, whether you're uh, part of the executive, whether you are uh, uh, back of back of house with the efficiencies in, in processing claims or whether you are a planner or whether you are, wherever you are in that, in that process of, of somebody allowing them to have structures to live their life, you are extraordinarily important. Um, I know that's a bit of a cop-out um, because on the other side of that conversation, I am both equally excited and, and, and nervous and all the, all the emotions in between. But, uh, mate, I, I love this scheme. I, I've loved it since I, I first started talking about it back in 2012 and to begin the role to chair this board. And uh, I, I, I do note that it is... It is um, it is going to be a, an extremely collaborative board. It's exciting to join it with um, with Graham Innes, with Marianne Diamond, uh, who are, and and of course the reappointment of Dennis Napthine as well to the existing board. I, I would be lying if I didn't acknowledge there's a there's a certain amount of nerves and anxiety as well. Well, that's what I'm glad you did say that about um, you know everyone being really important in the end of and you know i think the planners and the the front line people are probably more important than you can't don't don't take offense to that but uh uh it's really the people who are working directly with the people that that we need to we need to make sure that that that, that they that they deliver um the the promise that was the NDIS and and at the same time, your your role is very important and very exciting as well. So to to follow that up, I would I would, I would say as a as a young fellow, when you're going through the block funded system where you were finding supports, I didn't know what was behind the governance or the uh, or what was behind the system. I knew the person that was in front of me, and that person either made me feel like I was. I had a, a potential to live a great life or 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 I felt like I was a burden and I felt like I was um, like I was something that was getting in the road of doing their job so so that's why that's why it is you know it's it's the immediate response for me is that the important people in the scheme are, are the people that are face to face they 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 the, they're the they're the cold face of what will make this this scheme extraordinary. Now, you're the chair. Let's explain to people. What does the chair of the NDIS do? We, we had, you know, we had Bruce Bonahady, um, and, and we all got used to seeing him. And what, what do you, what, 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 what's the role can I look like with you in charge? Uh, Bruce was one of the first people that I called when, when the possibility of taking on this role um, uh, crossed my desk. I 
I see the chair of this organ of the, of the NDIA not only it, it facilitates meetings, board meetings, of course. It, it, it sets out with the board a collaborative conversation with the board and the executive about the strategic direction of the organisation. So uh, it can, it can, it, it the, the the chair of the board may not be able to turn. Uh, you know, it's not like tur- turning a Ferrari or something like that. It, it, it's more about the, the 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 changes that can be made long term when it comes to the the overall direction of the organisation. Uh, it also, you know, I I see the role also like 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 Bruce did that it is it is pivotal in stakeholder engagement as well to ensure that the voice of the community are held uh, are, are heard at the board level and that's why the last the last week i've been calling uh i've been calling stakeholders and i've been calling um leaders within the community and i've been calling people who who were a part of the part of the lobbying and a part of the conversation to to create this scheme as well so yeah, i, I can vouch for that term i have I got a text message from you and that I turned it up and I'm like, oh, I can't stand me. And, and I was like, oh, I'll see And um, when, when I ran it, you said to me, uh, so, George, what do we need to do for the NDIS? And I was like, no, it's 8.30 at night. I had a long day. Can we have this conversation in a, a reasonable hour? But... <laughs> Good on you for asking. Them. Uh, you made it. I, I haven't started the job yet, so so <laughs> I'm not. Uh, there is. Uh, there's. Uh, there's the, uh, the 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 acting chair or the the, the chair of Jim Minto is still in the role. Um, but, but I I truly want to make sure that it's understood that that this is an opportunity to have this is an opportunity to have the voice of people with disabilities well and truly heard in this role. If nothing more, if I do nothing more over the period of time that I am that I am in this role, it, it is about re, it is about building a trusted relationship with the community, and 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 that starts from being heard. Um, so that's why this week it, it hasn't been about talking to the media because I don't feel like this is there's a lot of this that isn't about me. Right, like this is about this is about making sure that we have uh, we have a board that through the chair has a connection to community. Indeed, indeed. And I think that we realised, you know, through the whole independent assessment uh, situation, that really listening to people is is what's going to make the NDIS work. And I'm very excited that you're, you've got listening as your number one priority. I want to ask you about your relationship with the NDIS and uh, uh, you were on the IOC, the Ind- Independent Advisory Council, uh, but you're not a participant, is that right? I'm not. And it was the first question that I was asked. And I used to have, uh, well, Stella Young used to rip into me every time that she saw me and she would ask me, are you on it yet? Are you on it yet? Are you on it yet? And, uh, and, and we used to have discussions and there was, there was an idea for a period of time that I wanted to make sure that I could advocate for the scheme from outside, from a, from a truly independent position um, that, that also that, that, I was in this privileged position through sport to have a direct contact to community that were providing me with, with what was reasonable and necessary to live a good life. Like I, I, I had this amazing, this amazing inbuilt tier two, right? <laughs> like, like, like a, 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 a sports provider that I had a direct contact in that would give me a, a, a wheelchair that allowed me access. I, I had a a, a partner or a. a of a family that uh, that offered um, that offered informal supports to for me to be able to continue to engage in the community as I was. Um, I did. I, I I actually I regret it now that I'm not. I, uh, but can uh, I stop you there, Kurt? Why, why do you regret it? For me, I, I heard the. Um, I was watching an interview just before 
which um, it was when it got announced that there were with Bill Thornton and Mary Ann Diamond, and, and you said that you regret not, not, not being on the screen. Why, why would you regret not being, you know, I regret depend on the government? Like, no one wants that. No, it's, it's, it's more I regret that people, that, that the community who rely on the scheme deserve to see a chair that that is with them. On that scheme, they they just like I hope to see a chair, a chair going forward that isn't just a person with a disability, but somebody who has had the experience of engaging with the scheme as a participant. Um, n- nothing more or less than that. It, it isn't a. Uh, I I have no idea whether I will uh, become a participant of the scheme. Uh, my experience with disability has changed as I have got older. And my experience with community uh, has changed as well. And like we know that disability needs are not stagnant; they change with life that is around you. You know your your ability to have choice and control, your ability to assess what is fair and reasonable, to live a good life, and your idea of what a good life is changes depending on where you are on that on that timeline. So at at some point I may, but the the, the reason why I say I regret it is purely because I I personally, I love that there is a person with a disability as chair. I really do. But I do look forward to the day that there is a participant of the scheme who is also in this role because that lived experience then will get taken to another level. I can say that. Thank you for, for clarifying that. Now, I know that you have also had other about roles in the sector and governance roles. So can you tell us a bit about those and and how you think they're going to help you in your current role? Yeah. And don't worry, this isn't, this isn't a job interview. You've already, you've already got the job, mate. I don't, I don't. <laughs> um, no, like, I, I had this... Um, yeah, I... I had to go through my um i had to go through my work over the last 20 years to actually convince myself to take the role to tell you through george because i do i think that i've always had a, a, i've always had a healthy dose of skepticism um i've jumped into some pretty wild stuff but i've always had a i've always had a bit of skepticism and i've always had to methodically go through the reasons why i believe i can be the right person at that period of time um I had the good fortune to be the to be the to be given an opportunity when I was immediately out of university. I was studying. I finished and graduated as a as a high school teacher, and I worked with an organisation that it was it was a wonderful organisation. It was a an non government organiser non government NGO working in the foreign aid space, spending volunteers abroad, and I was invited to join the board immediately out of out of uh, uni and they were starting to develop um, programs that would operate in the disability space and Bob Mine, his name is, he was uh, the head of my faculty at university, he was the chair of the board and he didn't want to go into that space until he had representation on the board and what I you know that's 2005, He's, he's already thinking that there is risk at a board level by not having the lived experience there. He recognised that you can have lawyers and accountants and you can have people who have worked in the sector, but if you don't have the voice of people who have who are living in the area that we are operating, that 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 op, that creates a layer of risk that is it is pretty hard to fill. Um, so he invited me on and I I joined as an observer for the first six months because I wanted to convince myself that I had value at that level. Um, and I joined and got a crash course on the fiduciary responsibilities of a director. I, from there, I fell in love with the I fell in love with the role that a director can play because it's like you are the it's like you get to what's the uh, it's like you get to guide an organisation or guide an agency through what can be some pretty troubled waters. <laughs> and 
you were able to you were able to create a lot of good from that role and we saw hundreds of australians going overseas creating you know amazing amazing programs and from there i i decided to continue that work and i i joined as many as many advisory groups as many um as many boards that i possibly could i I was voted in in the Athlete Council to to bring the athlete voice of the Paralympic movement, which is a proud movement for people with disabilities. Um, but that 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 athlete voice at the top level of the IPC to be a part of that as vice chair was incredible. To join the board of Sport Australia to help facilitate the the um, uh, the, the government support through Commonwealth Games, uh, Olympic Games, and Paralympic Games. I joined the board of Life Without Barriers because I felt like it was a part of my life that I would regret um, having worked abroad with disability. I wanted to see the other side of service provision um, and to see the people behind um, behind that that industry. Can I ask about Life Without Barriers? Because um, I'm really, yeah, I'm also on a uh, Board of Director for a Disability Provider, and yeah, the, the worst nightmare for any Board of Director is, um, you know, someone in the service being abused or in some way uh, not given the best service. What did you learn from the whole Royal Commission experience and everything that happened there? I I completely agree with you that I don't know I don't know any person that reads the uh, that reads that um, that follows along the stories of abuse neglect and uh, and any sort of harm that would come uh, somebody that is somebody that is within the Within, that is a, a client or a customer of or a participant of any sort of scheme that you're associated with. It's the stuff that keeps you up at night. I, 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 I learnt that there is, there, is, there is a lot that is felt when you are in one of those roles and you need to have a, uh, a, lot, of, a lot of trust in the organisation that you are a part of as well. And a good working relationship with the the CEO. Um, the reason why I joined L, LWB in particular is that it works in so many different aspects of this country, and it works in some of the most challenging parts of the sector. I we we know that disability is complicated, right? Like it is complicated, and the services that that provide people with disabilities access into life is is bloody um, diverse. Um, and when it goes when it goes well, it's great. When it goes bad, it hurts, and it hurts every person in every layer of every organisation that I've worked with. Um, that's that's my learning is that. You feel it. There is no way to escape it. It hurts. And anyone that's following, though, I would say, George, all of the the, the stories that come out of the Disability Royal Commission, every person should hear it. Every person should feel it. We need community to feel it or else we're not going to get change. So <sighs> yeah, just yesterday, mate, you heard the stories that came out about abuse directed directly towards people with disabilities on the streets and we need to confront these stories and we need to learn from them and we need to better, be better because of it. Um, I certainly do, Kat, and I, you know, I think that you're, you know, you being one of our people are going to be someone who's going to be able to really make sure that whatever happens to be in the US, that, that we are making sure that that people are other staff are safe and get the best services. 
I can I can assure you that whatever whatever decisions are, are, are coming ahead, that that they are going to be felt as well as heard. Okay, I want to maybe I'm really curious uh, to know uh, what, what what happened in terms of you being uh, that that moment when you were asked, like were you was it on the phone or? We just hang out with your mate Bill Thornton. <laughs> uh, I don't know. Like, was it? How did that happen? I don't know whether I'm allowed to divulge. Yeah, am I allowed oh, to come do- on? <laughs> this isn't secret service. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, it was a conversation. I was actually, um, I was actually meeting with Bill on another matter, and um, and I, I think that. I had worked with Bill for on and off for different periods in different things for a lot of years. I think that if you've been around the disability space since pre the NDIS, um, Bill did some work on uh, infrastructure and uh, accessible standards, um, and I did a couple of things for him back then. I think it was two thousand and eight, two thousand and nine. Yeah, um, I remember it was the parliamentary, parliamentary session. Session. I remember when that happened. I was like. Finally, some of the actual things to care. Uh, I actually remember saying something in a meeting with him, and I said, "I think I I worded uh, uh, I worded it as in we'll come knocking on <laughs> knocking on Bill's door, and Bill goes, "Hey, my door is open, and we'll go knocking on." <laughs> the next person, whether it was the prime minister's door, it was like, and the, it was an immediate. Oh wait, like that's you're you're with us there, and and I think that was a, a really refreshing conversation, and that was over ten years ago, and uh, and we've remained in contact, and we did little bits and pieces uh, over that period of time, and uh, and he, he he did mention a few times whether if he became. Uh, that uh, the the minister for the NDIS, whether or not I'd I'd work with him, and and I said I don't know. There's so much going on and everything like this. And then I was in the room with him, and and he asked me, and and uh, and and my immediate response was I I don't process things uh, immediately. I like I said I need to go away, and I need to actually make sure that intrinsically I believe I can do something good in that role and. And uh, I, so I said, I said no, and then he, he said, I want you to think about it, and he, he, he is a very convincing. Yeah, man. Yeah, the, you said no. My you immediate. Didn't, you, you didn't find it to think about. You said no. I, I'm too busy. Is no, it wasn't said? too busy. My, it but, was. I was scared, honestly, for a moment. Uh-huh. I, I went. And I thought I wasn't sure whether or not he was offering this job to about fifteen different people. So I looked around at the people in the room as well and said, "Is it what's happening here?" And then, um, and then I said, "I just need to think about it. I need to think about it." And um, I was in the middle of recording One Plus One on ABC. I was in the middle of recording. I, uh, I can't tell you the other show that I was recording. It's not announced till next year. Um, and. Uh, I, I was already on the board of LWB and, and and they were doing some really exciting work in a couple of fronts that I was I was cautious about uh, about leaving and I'd only been on there for 11 months at that point in time. I had started a production company with with my friend and we were just starting to produce a lot of content with with um, um, uh, a, a couple of other uh, brands. I just joined the board of Brisbane 2032, the the Paralympic and Olympic Games. I was I'm on the board of Sport Australia, so there was an immediate um, immediate kind of moment of fear. Um, how am I going to do this? <laughs> and then there was uh, I need to go away and see whether or not this is firstly possible. Um, secondly, whether or not I can do it and leave an impact that that I believe is um, aligns with with who I am. Um, and there was a conversation with my wife um, because this job, you know, it, it is a, a pretty intense role that has requirements around it. 
and I couldn't take it without talking to her and and she, her words were um her her words were look you might regret it if you take it because it is going to cause it is it will be a lot of stress but you will de- you will def you will definitely you will definitely regret it if you don't take it because oh. it, it it aligns so closely with 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 what you with what the change that you kind of want to be a part of and you've you've spoken about the agency and it's been a part of your life since before it was a thing um and whenever somebody asks her uh, how will you get through that um and how will you manage everything she goes we always manage like it's yeah. just we always manage no matter what happens we we get through it we sort it out yeah yeah so you said no and then the you spoke to your partner and had some time to think about it. I and said then no, and then I said, within a couple of minutes, I said, "Let me think about it. Give me a bit." And then, uh, and then I think um, I just sent a text message uh, back and said, "If you if you still want me, I'm in." So, what kind of chair can we expect from Kate Fremont? I think that. Um, I, I hope to be a collaborative chair. I, of, of course, I want to. I want to uh, work with the the board. I I also want to ensure that I am I am a chair that is listening to community. Uh, and we have an, a wonderful uh, part of the the structure of the NDIA that is the Inde- Independent Advisory Council, which I loved being a part of for three or four years. Um, that, that, that I know that you're 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 a member of as well, George. Um, that I look forward to engaging with in the um, so within the organisation itself. I also want to hear from the, the 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 staff. I want to get to know the staff. I want to listen. I want to listen to the participants, and I I want to uh, I want to also uh, I think that we also have a, a minister that is that is. Uh, passionate about making sure that this scheme is uh, successful and around for many, 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 many generations to come. So uh, I will be collaborative and not just in a board sense. I want to make sure that I want to make sure that the community see themselves in this role. I mean, I love early days, but very positive, like, and I know that you need to talk to the board and. You know, the board needs to work out, work, work out its priorities, but are there any sort of early ideas that you are willing to, like, I don't know, just... You're trying to sneak another scoop out of me, George. I know, no. I'm not ready. <laughs> no, I, my, my, my sole priority right now is to listen. That is yeah. it. Uh, I, I just want to. Uh, I want to listen to the community. I want to. I want to uh, get to know the get to know the organisation again. I, I'm excited for Rebecca to come in and to uh, Rebecca Falkington to come in as CEO and to 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 get behind this in, in, in incredible agency in her own way as well, and to to get to know how she how she uh, how she sees the, the 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 space going forward, but. For the moment, my sole priority is just to listen. Totally, totally glad to hear that. That is your priority. One of the big things that you've said and that Bill's been saying is that we need to rebuild trust. Um, and, you know, listening is a very good starting point. What else do we need to do to rebuild trust, do you think? I think that ensuring that people with disabilities are seen to uh, be a part of the improvement of the scheme. So it's not just listening; it'll be it'll be the the steps going forward where there are um, where there are opportunities to improve to ensure that the voice of disability is within that, and so that we can ensure that community are coming with us on the journey. Um, I think that's. Uh, I know that it's part of your uh, uh, that 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 it's something that you feel passionate about is is co-design and um, and that is about making sure that again it's not just my voice but it's 
it's not just the process of listening, it's, it's ensuring that what is heard is taken into the process going forward. I think that is how we build trust. I'm very big on listening and uh, one of the things that I try to do with this podcast is to uh, listen to the community and, and try and uh, put forward some of the, the questions and issues. And um, I went on to the grassroots social page and I invited members on that group uh, to throw some questions um, at you, Kat, and um, there's about 150 odd <laughs> raw questions. Recognising <laughs> recognizing that the role isn't operational and that uh, I'm going to put the proviso out there that it's not operational, that, I, that the, the individual circumstances of somebody's plan, uh, I, 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 I think there are very real limitations on how I can uh, either comment or, or assist on individuals on the individual case because then I think it would actually create a problem going forward then that would mean the person who has my mobile number or the person who's my family member or the person who lives next door to me has better access to the scheme than what than what every other participant does where this role is about it's about assisting in creating the structures so that every person every participant has equal access to this scheme so i'm putting all of those provisos plus i haven't started Plus, I haven't spoken to the board. <laughs> so I'm putting everything out there, George. Put it all out there, mate. And <laughs> how about we just uh, we go through the most reactive top three and just give me your instant, like, gut feeling, not your chat person of the board uh, response, right? Because technically you're not the chair until next week. So you can say whatever you like. <laughs> <laughs> I think we both know that it's that's that's not a hundred percent the case because there are decisions that are, will be coming ahead that require uh, collaboration with the board and and also uh, the uh, the the executive uh, need to be allowed the space to um, create their own space there as well. But that said, I'll I'll do my best. Look at me go. So question number one, okay. Why are NDA staff who have no medical qualifications overriding decisions that are made by medical and allied health specialists? So I'd lean back into my days in the in the um, IAC where you would talk about there was I, I always had a concern that there was there would be the potential where where medical professions would have too much say over somebody's plan. And then we would go to the medical model of disability. And I think that can create some risk. I think that if I was to have had a plan um, there that would have been designed by a medical professional, then my plan as a kid would have was well it was when i went to a medical profession and under the previous system my plan was defined in front of me and i was told i was told what the structures should be and i remember getting a wheelchair that was just it was impractical and it actually made my life worse um i i remember sitting there and saying to the health medical professional that this it won't work and being told that i don't know what i need um so it was meant to be a conversation about uh, an individual and, and take take more than just the report of a allied health professional, but also the conversations about a person's goals, about, um, about uh, you know, in my instance, I got the greatest bit of advice from a person with a disability sitting across from me. His name was Michael Callahan. Um, he looked at me he was as a person with a disability and he asked me what I wanted out of my equipment out of my life and he um and he designed a wheelchair for me that was the very first one that allowed me to actually live um and that wasn't an allied professional that was a person with a disability um what we would probably say at the 
the, either the planning phase um, who saw more than just the medical report. So I do, I, and in, in the IAC, back in those early stages, it was recognised that we would get better outcomes if we have planners with lived experience sitting across from a participant who is also um, a person with a disability, that you would, and and my in my instance, and again, this is not this is not speaking as a chair. This is uh, this is back in back in my day, <laughs> Dr. George. Back in my day, um, the medical plan would have been more expensive with worse outcomes. Um, and I'll just add to that: there's the fact that the agency is bound by the Indigenous Act and the Act you know, talk that was unnecessary and we need to make sure that regardless of whether the medical expert says it also needs to meet the the, the section of the act that, that talks about what can get funded. I'm gonna take you to another one. This is mine. No, it's not really, but I I I <laughs> agree full heartedly around this one. Why aren't we provided with the opportunity to look over a draft of our plan to ensure that no mistakes or misinformation occurs before the plan gets approved? Um, Good idea, don't you think? Well, how about that? How about I, 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 I am... I hate to make commitments before I join the board, but I, I think <laughs> I'm definitely committed to working with the agency to improve the participant plan experience. And and uh, I think transparency in that um, transparency in that process will assist in that conversation around trust. So, um, <laughs> well. I don't. I, don't I, I, I make no promises, Doctor Stewart. I haven't. I haven't been in the role yet. I. No. Uh, I, I haven't. Uh, I'm, I'm not there yet. But I do look forward, and I, I. I will. I will commit to exploring how. How. How the. How the process can meet participants' expectations, and I would say over the last couple of weeks, one of those participant expectations has been greater visibility over that. Yeah, yeah, and, and I think that would be beneficial to the agency as well. Uh, okay, last one. Don't worry, it's nearly over. <laughs> <laughs> In circumstances where the participant is happy with their current plan, why can't we just roll it over um, so we don't have to go through the stress of a plan review? Yeah, I do know that. Um, I do know that. Uh, um, is, I did speak about earlier about somebody's plan uh, changes as they head through, and their experience with disability changes um, throughout their life. So, but um, over the last, it, I could be wrong, but throughout COVID, there was uh, an increase in the amount of time that you could roll over your plan. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah. I, I would. I would like to say that that could be one of the benefits from uh, the experience of COVID is that there's there, there seems to be, and I, I, again, I'm not there, the lesson learnt that that is an efficiency and uh, a, a way that we can, um, a way that we can allow also somebody to have the surety over life of what life will look like in two years' time, in three years' time. Um, the only the only thing in the back of my head is uh, is, is that somebody's goals change as they age, and the ability to be able to reassess a plan and and go forward to ensure that that is appropriate still um, uh, that is that is the only the only kind of uh, what is it called light bulb that is there. But um, I think every person with a disability has been in the place where you've had to fill out. Are you still in a wheelchair? <laughs> <laughs> I'm still the same. Wow. You, well, that's a, yep. that's the same as what it was <laughs> when I was born, and it, was uh-huh. the, it will be the same until I am. Uh, I, uh, well, it won't be the same. I, I hope that my goals and that my 
you know, I hope that it is that reassessed what is reasonable and necessary for me to live a good life is 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 reassessed. But you know what my, my thoughts are on this question is that yeah, totally, you know, if you wanna roll over then that should be your option. But I think it's important that we do you know, check in um and, and and see how we're going in, in terms of um achieving the the goals and getting the support that we need. But I just, it also reminds me of the fact that if planning was not so scary and people were so terrified of having their plans cut, then it would be quite an okay thing to do every couple of years, right? Um, the, the, the plan was always a facilitator of outcomes. So those outcomes need to change throughout your life. And I think that we need to be focused on what those outcomes are. And so so there can be something that is uh, that is positive about having a, a, a um about having a, a, a reassessment of of where you're at, but grease and oil change. Um I think the when you, you mentioned fear, which has been another thing that has been brought up with me, brought up to me. Um, and George, I'm not going, to, I'm not a chair that can disappear as well. So I don't, I don't exist. Um, everywhere I go for the last two weeks, people have spoken to me about their experience with the NDIA. So, and that won't change. That can't change because I can't, I live in Newcastle. I pick my kids up at school. I go to their sports. I travel. I, I hope to engage in the community. So that means I'm going to, I'm going to hear those and I'm going to, I'm going to always, you know, take, take that stuff on board. It's um, the fear reduction will hopefully be another beneficiary, uh, another outcome of the rebuilding of trust. Speaking of fear, is there anything that you're afraid of going into this? Um, you know what? I haven't really spoken about this a lot, but I I, I, I have an- anxious for sure, fear, absolutely. Um, I first started racing when I was, 18 years old in front of 118,000 people and I was terrified. I was thrown up in a bin, um, scared, really scared. And I spent a lot of years learning how to manage my anxieties and I managed them really effectively. And and part of managing those anxieties is the process that I spoke about earlier on where I take the time to go through things and I'm, I'm very much a planner and and I try and ensure that where I, what I'm doing and, and what I'm heading into, I can do good at, and it meets the the values that I that I do that I do hold. Um, I'm there is a part of me that was extraordinarily scared about this role, but over this period of time, speaking to the community, I've been able to get through those anxieties um, uh, because each conversation I have helps me think that maybe I can do this role and maybe at this point in time I'm the right person for this role. Uh, um, but uh, there's there's a lot of, yeah, there, I, my life is about managing lots and lots of fears. Yeah, totally. And I, I really appreciate your honesty about that. Can I be honest with you about Seeing that you've been so open with me, I'll tell you a little secret. <laughs> when, uh, yeah, go back 12, 15 years ago, um, whenever I'd see you on the TV, I'd be like, oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> Can't tell me dad. Oh, change the channel. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, for a lot of us, like, who, you know, aren't elite sports people, we do get a little bit angsty about um, the fact that, you know, in this country, for a disabled person to, you know, get recognised, they need to run really fast or hit a ball really well. You know, just look at, you know, you know the fact that, 
we no, we we have a society that idolizes sports people and a lot of us can't play sport, right? I I've recognized that when you work in the in the advocacy community and I I I feel like I I have only brushed against the surface of that. Yeah, but I've I've recognized that there is a there is a divide. Um and Stella was very open with it and and we got Stella over to to London and the the, the conversations that I had in the media about about Paralympians are very different to the culture that I was brought up in. And I love the culture that the Paralympic sport is. You know that we were born in the backfields of World War Two, and um, and one of the people who were our first Paralympians is is Uncle Kevin Coombs, and like they built the third biggest multi sport event in the world out of refusing what non disabled people had told them that they can't do. They just refused to hear it. And they built this thing regardless. And Uncle Kevin in particular, he had to, he wasn't able to compete underneath Australian passport and he refused to stop. He, he got an honorary British passport because he was an Indigenous man in a wheelchair and he refused to stop. And he built a team for the next five five Paralympic Games and he allowed the generosity to every Paralympian that's come before after him to call him uncle and that's not, it wasn't just Uncle Kevin, it's Elizabeth Edmondson, it was Frank Ponter, it was, you know, Terry Giddy to Errol Hyde to, you know, to, you know they, these are, uh, I know that because we are a, a, a nation that is consumed by sport, that, that, that this was bombarded down people with disabilities uh, kind of eyes and, 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 but inside it, it was a proud movement of incredibly, incredibly brave amazing pioneers that that I got to kind of live with and so, and I make they are my heroes I bloody love them um eh, eh, but but right now right now we have incredible alongside that, that that movement of Paralympians there has been a disability rights movement that hasn't got the 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 spotlight that it deserves uh, but we now have people like Rhonda Galaby, uh, Galaby, uh, Carly Finley, Dinesh Palapana, George Steele, John, George Teleporis, Naz Campanella on the ABC. You know, uh, we we are getting to the point in community where we have built this incredible Paralympic mechanism that challenges misconceptions around disability. They don't talk about overcoming their disability. They are beautiful, complex people with disability who have found a medium that they love. Um, I got that, sidetracked, George. <laughs> no, but yeah, can't make, you know, I remember that the year of Tomoko, I, I didn't know you, you sent me the message on Twitter and you said, you know, if there's anything I can do to amplify your voice, um, yeah, just drop me a line. And I thought, oh, wow, like this, this is someone who, actually believes in community and you know you have a platform that a lot of people don't but you're you know it's obvious to me that you want to use that that platform to really you know bring the whole community along with you hey but but you are my community like I, I, the the paralympic world wasn't it wasn't just those who were you know got that incredible amazing experience of wearing the green and gold there are a thousand people with disabilities who'd never wore the green and gold but they're my family and 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 like i don't know i I think that you would find once you get into the community itself that there are there are a big bunch of people who are extremely thoughtful like jared clifford madison de rosario like they are they are some of the most thoughtful and eloquent people that I have ever met, and they do have a strong sense of social justice and a strong sense of dis- where we need to be when it comes to disability rights. Um, I just think that the the media have had issues telling those stories, uh, and and I think that I think Madison spoke about it in Tokyo. You don't have to be a Paralympian to be exceptional. Like 
that's a Paralympian saying that. I, 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 I hope, George, that I do remember shooting you a message and it was before this role. So I don't know, it was a long time ago. It was a long time ago and um, I don't know. I just think that um, I, I'm, I, I just think that the, the Paralympic movement is a lot more complex than what, an, uh, to be honest, what a non-disabled media has spoken about it for a generation. Now that's going to change because there are disabled voices in the media like Naz Campanella. Um, I, I'm trying to uh, think of the young fella from um, SBS as well as the, you know, but that those those stories will change now because I think we will be able to have our own voice in, within it. And my friends from the community that's listening to us, I'm um, excited about this uh, this journey, and I'm excited to meet the people within within the organisation, and I'm excited about uh, also having also having a, a a more complex conversation publicly about what the NDIA and the NDIS is. That a lot of the times over the last you know over the last three years we've only seen a conversation about the NDIS being this single line item in a budget where it is so much more than that. It is a facilitator of disability rights. Disability rights are human rights. It has a productivity gain within the community. Like a, it, it, there, there is so much more to this scheme than, than, a, than a single line item that is a headline of a, of a newspaper. Um, and I'm, I'm excited about having that conversation with community as well. Uh, I'm, I'm so excited to have you, Kat, as our chair of the NDIS. I'm really looking forward to lots more conversations and just seeing uh, the journey that you're about to go on and the journey that the whole community is about to go on with you as, as our Oh, my God. Seven, seven, cat family. Thank you for joining me. Anytime, George. Thanks, mate. That's all we have time for on today's episode of Visible and Necessary. Thanks for joining us. And thank you also to our partner for this episode, the National Disability Insurance Agency, to be notified of future episodes, please don't forget to hit the subscribe button and the notification bell. Thanks for listening, and until next time, stay well and reasonable.